think more Web3 natives discovered very quickly that it's, it's pretty hard to make games. We came at it from the opposite direction. We had been Web2 developers for a very, very long time. We started to become aware of the concept of Web3 games back in like 2020, 2021. But it seems to us that in 2020, most of the Web3 games were in the hyper casual space. And so we were like, maybe this needs to mature a little bit before we get into it. What if we made it like a tri AAA style game with this, right? There's a couple of different avenues to look at it. W one of which is the kind of digital ownership angle. In one game ecosystem, you might have zero access to the ability to trade your assets at all. And in another one, they may provide full trading access, but it's all centralized and centrally governed. The idea with Web3 is that we're committing ourselves permanently to the idea that everybody will freely be able to trade all of their digital assets in a completely decentralized way. So we never have the ability to essentially change that. It's looking at it from a, a very specific and committed perspective of allowing the free trade of assets amongst players. So that Welcome to another episode of the Entangling Web3 podcast. Today, we're excited to have Dan Nicolaitis joining us on the show to share his insights on the intersection of Web3 and gaming. Dan is currently the CTO at Studio 369 and brings with him an impressive CV spanning 20 years in the game development sphere and working for the likes of Warner Brothers Games. Recently, he and the team at Studio 369 have been working hard on Metalcore, a new game that gives players the option to connect a Web3 wallet with their own in-game digital assets. Now, this is such an interesting idea and one we've actually discussed quite a few times recently on the podcast. I've certainly got a lot of questions, so let's just jump straight into it. Dan, it's a huge pleasure to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Hey, Dan, how are you doing today? Great. Yeah, looking forward to it. Good. Glad to have you on. I am an avid gamer, as is Jack. We're super excited. We always say that gaming kind of pushes the boundary on this kind of stuff. So it's really nice to have someone who's actually involved in pushing that boundary with Web3 and gaming. Jack gave a little hint as to your resume, what you've been working on. But could you tell us a little bit about your early career, how you got into some of the work that you're doing now? Yeah, I started off my career in the game industry, traditional PC console games, got my start at Midway Games, working on the likes of Mortal Kombat and Stranglehold and a bunch of early Unreal Engine 3 titles in the core technology group there. Eventually moved off, and joined Warner Brothers when Warner Brothers acquired Midway Games and then moved off and started my own companies, worked for kind of smaller indie developers as well, like Phosphor Games, and wound up here with my two co-founders, Vic Lopez and Matt Candler, who I had worked with previously. And yeah, now we're exploring the fresh new world of Web3 Games. That's a perfect inroad. So obviously this is a Web3 podcast. You've been in the gaming space for 20 years now. now what do you think that Web3 actually has to offer for gaming generally? And how important is that? It's very interesting. There's a couple of different avenues to look at it, right? So w one of which is the kind of digital ownership angle and that there's kind of a very wide uh, list of features that kind of traditional Web2 developers would uh, provide to their customers uh, in terms of being able to share or trade their assets. So in one game ecosystem, you might have zero access to the ability to trade your assets at all. And another one, they may provide full trading access, but it's all centrally or centralized and centrally governed. The idea with Web3 is that we're committing ourselves permanently to the idea that everybody will freely be able to trade all of their digital assets in a completely decentralized way. So we never have the ability to essentially change that. So there are analogs in Web2, but it's looking at it from a, a very specific and committed perspective of allowing the free trade of assets amongst players. So that's one angle you could take, take from it. Another angle you could take from it is a little bit more of an experimental angle, which is how much of this gameplay can actually happen on chain? How much can you develop actual decentralized design, right? The What I mentioned before is more like just the digital assets, but the core of the game could be identical to what you would have played in, in a Web 2 version, right? It could be just essentially Call of Duty, but the assets, instead of living on somebody's database, they live in on a blockchain. This other idea is more like, could we develop game design concepts and ideas and mechanics that actually play out within the blockchain themselves. And that is a little bit more kind of experimental and future looking and interesting. There are some people who are doing it in a very limited way, but I think that's also a separate angle that a lot of people are, are, are interested in. Yeah, that's a great summary. I think we recently covered, as I said, this idea of Web3 and gaming. 
in a recent episode and we talked a lot about applying web3 to traditional games which i think is on the first point you mentioned right making the in-game assets the in-game currency something that's more transportable it's portable between different games you can take it out and use it in the real world for other things that kind of thing and then yeah that experimental side is something we only really touched and scratched the surface on at the end i think that's really interesting as well so w- what kind of use cases do you think are there for that more experimental side so where you are putting logic on the blockchain so one that comes to mind that i've seen is doing things like poker so where you have random number generation for dealing a hand of cards it's a nice to have a kind of provably fair random generation of that number but are there any other use cases you know of for the gameplay pieces that involve blockchain directly yeah there's a lot of interesting applications to the social aspect of games like social fi type stuff and governance in games there's a lot of scenarios where games maybe evolve over time, the metagame changes, the parameters of the game change, and that affects how players can play, and allowing the community to use the blockchain as a kind of means of governance in order to help affect those changes uh, is an interesting application. Um, The other one is basically just this idea that there is, it's almost the, the game of life are you guys familiar with game of life mm-hmm. like it, it's like this 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 kind of simulation system that you let it free and then it does whatever it's going to do and plays out so from a game design perspective it's it's a very interesting challenge because let's say you're going to deploy a game of chess to the to the blockchain that's like some distributed massively multiplayer chess game or something like that once you develop the rules and deploy it players will figure out how it works and they'll be able to figure out the mechanics and then figure out what the best kind of approach to the game is. And you as the game developer can't really change that, right? So Mm -hmm. it's this kind of new idea of of iterating on different versions of kind of a static set of rules that you then release into the wild. And then maybe you can make some changes to it in in the next run. But for all practical purposes, you have no access or control over over whatever happens in the version that you deploy and all the players are playing, right? So there's a lot of interesting challenges. There's a it's almost a bit of a game, like Conway's game of life, like I, I alluded to, almost for game developers, where we're like we're almost like I, I wonder what this is going to do when I release it into the wild, right? So yeah, there's a lot of really interesting experimental stuff that that's going to happen in the future with Web three. Yeah, that's really exciting. I think like when you immediately think of the Web3 space and how it applies to gaming, like ownership of assets is so important. We you know any gamer knows like, how important it is to have skins, like the kind of the social currency you get with displaying that, and then the ability to verify that. Like the idea of being able to take that from your one profile to the next profile and prove who you are between games across the whole place is getting into this metaverse space, which doesn't really exist as a lot of people know, but people are pushing towards that. I think that the concept you touched on there around the idea of like, how much can you put on chain? I love the idea idea of putting assets on chain, making decisions on chain collectively when you have like a a month to make a decision, for example. But I saw like early days, people were saying, okay, every single move of your first person shooter is going to be on chain. And you're like, is that really possible when you're shooting a bullet every microsecond? Is that actually possible? Definitely not. Uh, not right mm-hmm. now. So, so yeah, so there's a, a, a pretty uh, a huge kind of gradient between Web 2 and Web 3, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And there's people using new terms like Web 2.5, and, and anything in between, right? Um, mm. And I, I think like the easiest integration for Web3 is to basically just do what, what we mentioned earlier, which is to take, uh, for, for all intents and purposes, an existing game that runs on traditional Web2 infrastructure, hardware, engines, et cetera, and um, essentially swap the inventory system for a Web3-based inventory system, right? That's basically what we're doing in, on Metal Core. And, and the next step that you can do is to push little bits of logic to the chain primarily things that are, as you mentioned, slower paced, not the types of things that you're doing every second or every, let alone every millisecond, but maybe decisions you're making once a day or once a month or once a week, something like that. The trouble with the blockchain, obviously, is that every transaction has a cost. There's still, even though on things like layer two, the, those costs are significantly lower than they would be on on a layer one like Ethereum, they're still not quite at the level that they would be on a normal uh, Web2 database that's highly optimized. But even on a normal Web2 database that's highly optimized, you wouldn't try to write a first-person shooter that runs on that, right? So on, I, I think that kind of blue sky idea that a first-person shooter with all of its logic will run entirely on-chain is really probably never going to happen. There's just no mm-hmm. real use case for that that makes sense. But 
there can be a bunch of logic that gets pushed to the chain, like logic around if there's a persistent world about like the effect that your actions have in the world, assuming that those actions are infrequent enough that the rules around them can be applied to, to on-chain actions, right? So, and those are the types of things that we're interested in exploring too, as we expand from maybe more of a web 2.1, 2.2 game and kind of push the envelope and get closer to web three. Those are the types of things that we're going to be working on. Yeah, the one that me and Jack like often talk about is the idea of user-generated content. Every gamer knows that the best content by far is made by the people that play the game and love the game. And the idea of rewarding people for that user-generated content, you spend X amount of time in that environment and your micro-incentives potentially for actually being in there. I think that's a really powerful concept. The other one we talked about is loot boxes. There's a lot of kind of a lot of issues right now, legally and regulatory around loot boxes. Are they legal? Should they be legal? Should kids be betting on these things? But how do you have transparency into how are the odds actually fair? Are people being rewarded in the way that they're being promoted? And that's another big angle. I imagine that maybe a lot of Web3 developers are looking into this space. Yeah, for sure. I think that definitely loot boxes is, is continue to be a, a touchy subject. But yeah, in terms of fairness, uh, that's definitely something that that we're very interested in, making sure that everything is like provable on the Web3 side and that most of the, like this kind of idea that as you play, you're rewarded for play in the same uh, means that you would be on a traditional Web2 game, right? As you play a, a typical Web2 game, you're rewarded with some form of in-game currency or some progression mechanic. Take World of Warcraft, for instance. As you play, you get, you earn more gold. Typically, what you would see in, in traditional Web2 games, you would see pretty much every game that has a significant monthly user base would have this issue of, even if it's against a TOS, there would be gold farmers, right? There would be people who are playing the game to try to earn gold and then sell it on illicit markets mm. in order to make money, right? And I think it makes a lot more sense if we design our game around this idea that's going to happen, right? Mm. We, we accept the fact that's going to happen. So let's build that into our economy and try to design it in such a way that it, it isn't exploitative. It isn't in, like completely imbalanced it still allows people who are just interested in, in having fun in the game to have fun it still allows for this behavior of i may be like a working parent who only has a couple hours uh, a week to play this game that i'm really interested in and i have some disposable income to throw at at progressing faster than everyone else mm -hmm. ultimately as game developers we still have to make money it's the still the free-to-play model right mm -hmm. um, and the free-to-play model still has some those aspects of hopefully we may we strike the right balance of it's mostly fair for everybody as as much as we can make it and there are some people who can pay to not necessarily pay to win we don't we never want it to be pay to win but pay to progress a little bit more quickly and not have to sink as much time into the the progression mm. as everyone else right or maybe pay to have something that's like really just some really cool cosmetic or something that really is just bragging rights right mm -hmm. so that's the way we're looking at it and i think that's I, coming from a web2 background we wanted to keep it as close to the Web2 design paradigm as we could, and then just implement the things that naturally came with Web3. Yeah, I think that's a very smart approach to take. I'm curious because you brought up this idea of play to win, which I think is a problem a lot of people have with existing Web2 games, right? Where the more money you put in, the better equipment you get in game, the better skins you get, and it becomes harder to compete if you don't actively pay more money than the actual game price itself. So one of the things, as you mentioned, play to earn, that's one of the new things that I think Web3 is trying to introduce, this model of earning currency or, or tokens, native tokens for playing games. And I think that people are, seem to be pretty split on that one as to whether that's going to work. But I'm curious, another one that I, I think you haven't mentioned is around things like micropayments. And that's something that you get with Web3 or at least scalability issues aside that are being worked on. The ability to do micropayments is, is something interesting, I think, because as an example, I've seen a game where you can play simple arcade games, but you, your position on the leaderboard then gets you a, a share of other people's paying to play the game. So there's interesting dynamics you can do there. I'm, I'm just curious to get your take on how, how, how much of that side do you think we will see in the future as well? And, and, and also maybe on the play to earn side, do you see that as being a viable model? Which side of that debate do you come down on? Yeah, there's a lot of different approaches to this. So there's a huge spectrum of, of ways that people look at it. The way we look at it is play to earn is not really what we're after. We're not looking at the people who play our game as earners. We're looking at them as customers, right? We're looking at them as traditional gamers as you would in a Web2 game, right? Within any sort of Web2 free-to-play, Web2 economy, there is 
a huge aspect of or, or function for this idea of progression and players having these feelings like they're progressing and that they're participating in the economy of the game better than everyone else. And they like that kind of competitive aspect of it. And so that portion of things is how we want players to think of the game, that they're really that it's a game at heart, right? In terms of making it pay to win, it, it depends on what you define as pay to win, right? What we really want is for anybody who plays the game completely for free to feel like if they're skillful at the game, to feel like they have a sporting chance in every encounter that they might have. Now, they might not get access to exclusive tournaments because they're not a premium member. They might not get access to cool, really cool cosmetics. Their barony might not have nobility status, and et cetera, right? All these other aspects that play within the kind of the larger metagame framework of the game. But within any sort of 1v1 firefight, we want to make sure that if you're if you outskill the other guy, it doesn't really matter what you have and what he has, you're going to win, right? So that's the way we're looking at designing it. But yeah, like I said, there's so many different ways to approach it that there's definitely people out there who are looking at it more from a, a play to earn perspective. I'm not really sure how that's going to work out. I, we're game developers at heart, and so we really don't want to consider any of the people who are interacting with our token as earners. We prefer to just think of them as traditional customers. Okay, so we've talked about the game at quite a high level. Maybe it's time to actually get into the nitty gritty of what the game is. I have seen that this has been described as something between Titanfall and Destiny, and I have logged so many hours on Titanfall 2. So that's like a big bode for you guys. Can you tell us a little bit more about Metalcore? What's the premise? What's the vision behind the game? Yeah, so the kind of backstory of Metalcore is humanity loaded up these four generation ships to a distant star and there were colony ships basically right and there were a series of disasters en route and three of them lost communication with one another so over the course of a thousand years they all developed separate cultures and very bizarre and different from one another and when they landed naturally they were they were at war with one another so you take the role of somebody on the fourth ship who emerges from cryostasis and realizes that everything on this what was supposed to be this utopia is a state of perpetual war and you're being sent down to basically participate now. So the world of Metalcore is pretty richly defined. Uh, in terms of the gameplay, it's effectively a third-person shooter MMO. You can play as infantry, you can play in an aircraft, in a tank, in a vehicle, in a giant mech, on a, a big open battlefield. We have PvP sessions, we have PvE raids, we have big open sandbox PvX scenarios so a little bit of uh, of a lot of different games all, all mashed into one but it feels a little bit like a like an mmo like you can decide to focus on missions and defeating bosses and etc to progress and then maybe you want to flex your might and all the new kind of vehicles you just unlocked and crafted in pvp so you go fight some pvp sessions and you bounce back and forth between those two so at a high level that describes metalcore you know that there's a lot more features that i could get into but hopefully that paints the picture for you guys yeah, I did catch some of the gameplay footage and I thought this is definitely something up my street. I, I saw some gameplay of the of someone in a mech suit and I was like, oh, this is like Edge of Tomorrow. This is very cool. So yeah, I, I think one, one thing I want to ask you about is the choice to go with a game that supports Web3 in a sense. I think when a lot of people have developed games that call themselves Web3 games or embedding Web3 in some way, a lot of the time in the past, the gameplay and the story and all the kind of the typical classical gaming elements that people really care about have been neglected and the actual quality of the game has been le left to the wayside, basically. So what way around did you approach this? Did you start with a really great game idea in mind and then think, how do I bring some of those Web3 benefits like a digital asset ownership to it? Or did you kind of get orange pilled on Bitcoin and thought, oh, no, I want to do something around crypto and Web3? Which way around did that happen? Yeah, it's a good question. So so I a lot of the projects that you're seeing, I think you're referring to are stuff that has come from, I think, more Web3 natives and people whose core competency is really like Web3 marketing and community building and et cetera. And they saw the natural fit with Web3 and games and thought, let's start a game project and probably discovered very quickly that it's, it's pretty hard to make games. But yeah, we came at it from the opposite direction. We started off on this idea with, like I said, we had been Web2 developers for a very long time, had, had be, started to become aware of the concept of Web3 games back in 2020, 2021, but hadn't really thought much of, are we going to be able to try to pull one of those off? Because we didn't want to stray into the realm of hyper-casual, like we're, we're all relatively 
hardcore game devs, right? Like we work on console PC titles, first person shooters, action adventure type stuff. We have worked on mobile games and hyper casual stuff in the past, but it seems to us that in 2020, most of the Web3 games that were coming out and that we're seeing a lot of viral response were in the hyper casual space. And so we were like, maybe this needs to mature a little bit before we get into it. Towards the end of 2021, we had shipped a mech VR game for uh, Quest 2 called World of Mechs. Pretty fun. You, you can check it out. And it was just like a 4v4 mech, first, essentially mech shooter. And we were like, okay, we have a solid foundation for fun mech gameplay mechanics here. What if we made a bigger PC slash console, like the tri- AAA style game with this, right? And at the same time, some investors that we had worked with before were interested in developing a more kind of core PC console web three game and so they were like well let's marry these two ideas together so we had the concept of a large open world mech game back in like mid 2021 and we started to develop it into what if it was a web three game essentially right so a lot of there are like as you alluded to there are a lot of i think traditional web two games that like mid cycle flirted with the idea of adding nfts or adding a web three like mid development cycle we did that right at the beginning of our development cycle. So we had this idea, we had these people who wanted, were interested in developing a Web3 game and we just married them together. And that's the start of Metal Core. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And it's good to know that you you had a strong buy-in for both the core gaming elements as well as the, the, the necessary parts of Web3. And I want to ask a bit more about that. So specifically, because we talked at a high level about the kind of options you have with games, what Web3 things to add. So specifically, can you tell us a bit more about how Metalcore does utilize things like digital assets and Web3? And also, one thing I noticed when I was looking at the game is that there's an emphasis on them being optional for the user, which from, from my first glance, it seems like a really smart move. So you don't alienate anyone who this isn't important to. But yeah, I'd like to know a bit more about the thinking behind that as well. Yeah, we knew early on that we needed to because we're we're core PC, hardcore kind of PC console game, we needed to try to bridge that gap between Web3 and Web2 users, that we would never really grow to the degree that we needed to grow solely on the back of hardcore Web3 gamers alone. So early on, we made the decision that this game has to be playable as a free-to-play Web2 game if if you want to. So that that's what we set out to do. Uh, connecting, creating and connecting your wallet. We're launching with, so we're partnered with Immutable for most of our Web3 side integration. And we're using their passport wallet system and their NFTs and, and tokens will be on CKVM as well as Bridge from L1. But early on, we made the decision that you could register and create a, an account uh, and play Metalcore without ever connecting a wallet. Obviously, you wouldn't be able to earn any tokens. You wouldn't be able to engage in any of the Web3 side of things. And our goal was to make it so that if players were interested in joining in, and started playing it as a Web2 free-to-play player and thought, this is super fun. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. Why would I not create a wallet and join in? I'm just missing out on my daily rewards mm-hmm. and on, on the ability to tr- turn these into NFTs. I'm just leaving these features on the table, right? In terms of how we're using it, we, we do have a, a, a single token. It's a capped in-game utility token. We're using it as basically our premium currency in-game, right? So if uh, as opposed to in a typical free-to-play game, you're, you're buying gems or whatever you're doing with fiat and you're using those gems in-game to speed up your repairs or your timers or whatever, make everything go a little bit faster for you so you can get back in the game. We're doing that, except you buy our equivalent of gems, which we call shards, using our token. And then as you play, you're rewarded, depending on how much you're engaging with the Web3 side of things, you can participate in those reward pools for the token as well. So every week we'll be giving out X number of tokens as rewards through our treasury. And then that's the cycle, right? Players spend the token to get the premium currency. It goes back into the reward pool. And then at the end of the week, some percentage of that reward pool is released back to players. So it creates this thing where the players generate the economy and they may choose to sell that token or they may choose to put it back into the game and continue playing more what the choice is there right so the nfts themselves we we did this initial infantry genesis mint of infantry nfts on layer one ethereum and we provided this bridge path down to zk evm once we started working with immutable future mints will likely straddle both layer one and immutable but they'll all be usable in game they're all assets that you can play as so they're all vehicles or infantry characters in the game that you can trade and play as and uh, yeah our goal is to basically mirror the player inventory in the web3 in the blockchain 
this seems like honestly a perfect marriage of like web3 tech and gaming <laughs> like, i think i just want to have a go on this now and give it a whirl i want to know a bit more about like say the future roadmap of some of the things you're doing in metal you talked a little bit about you know, world of mechs and that kind of immediately makes me think of vr metaverse all this kind of hype cycle stuff do you buy into the idea of metaverse does that fit into the roadmap can you tell me a bit more about that so it's, it's it, when people talk about metaverse, I think that they're all talking about different things. Effectively, mm -hmm. Fortnite is a metaverse, right? Roblox is a metaverse. Mm -hmm. So there, these things already kind of exist. Really, what we're talking about when we talk about metaverses, we're talking about large UGC or large ecosystems that encourage other people to come in and help create for them. Web3 does a really good job of empowering that because it creates this, this kind of open standard. For instance, I can't stop somebody for, from creating a fan app that allows you to view your metal core inventory on your mobile device, right? I, literally anybody can go and do that right now. And I used to use this website called Wowhead back in the day when I played, played World of Warcraft and Blizzard shut off access to that when they switched to their kind of WoW Armory support and stuff. And I was really sad because I had supported this community team in creating this fan run website and, and being able to look at my character and theory craft different builds and stuff like that. And the interesting thing about Web3 is that you're basically committing to this guaranteed open ecosystem where you cannot stop people from creating these add-ons to the ecosystem. Now, the question of whether or not they can participate in the economy or whether they're incentivized to do that is a different thing, right? So, so finding the right structure for incentivizing people is a really important thing, I think, for Web3 projects that want to make that jump into the idea of a metaverse. I think the term metaverse is a little bit grandiose for what we're really making. I would call it more of a game IP or a game universe, right? We have, we're developing a metalcore game IP or a metalcore game universe. There may be other games that take place and other people may develop some of them. And finding kind of the right balance of kind of token distributions and rewards and et cetera, I think is beneficial to everybody who, who participates. So that's definitely a huge part of Web3 in my mind. I, I really love that kind of the motivation behind this stuff as well and like emphasizing the importance of the protocols and the foundation layer like staying fixed so that when people build things on top of that, you know, like it reminds me of Vitalik and his like why he built Ethereum because his uh, World of Warcraft account got nerfed, right? And he was fuming. So he like really right. jumped into decentralized open protocols. And it's so important. Like this is such an, an important area. I do completely agree with the, uh, the concept that metaverse means a lot of things to a lot of people. I think most people, when they think of it, they think ready player one and then, like everyone's right, going right, to be in there right. doing all the things and everything's open and combined but here we're a long way away from that one other thing i'd like to talk to you about is you know everyone's talking about it right now so i had to ask you how impactful do you think ai is going to be not just generally in the world for coding large language all this kind of stuff but for gaming specifically i think it's going to be have a huge impact there's no getting around the idea i mean Sadly, a lot of really talented concept artists that I know are really struggling to find work right now. That's been the most direct thing that AI has impacted in terms of, of game dev careers. At the same time, it's going to empower a lot of indie developers to maybe be able to make things on shoestring budgets that were that are of, of different level of quality than they were able to before, right? So there's pros and cons. I think there's always going to be some purists out there who are like, we want to make games the old way. And so it's never, I don't think it's going to be like the only way to make games in the future is using AI. I think there, there's always going to be a place for handcrafted, what have you, any sort of content. But there's no denying that people are going to start, especially as AI just becomes so good. I mean, we're not really using AI extensively right now, although we have some thoughts about not necessarily AI content generation. We have more thoughts about how we use AI with our dynamic mission system as almost more like a Left 4 Dead style game manager mm -hmm. where it really paces the player and, and tries to learn how to provide encounters for the player that that are that, that keep kind of their intensity curve in the kind of uh, green zone or whatever, right? In, in, in an area where we want it to be. But in terms of like AI generated content, there's no doubt that people are going to start replacing a lot of writing staff with a, a lot of concept staff and in the future, a lot of art, maybe even a lot of programming staff, right? So teams will be smaller for sure. It'll impact the industry as a whole. And yeah, it's, it's really hard to say how fast it's going to come, but I would be very surprised if it didn't have a huge impact in the industry within the next two or three years. Yeah. I mean, if the current rate of developments in AI is anything to go on, then yeah, we don't have that much time ahead of us before these things do make a huge impact. I, talking about UGC again as well and the relation with AI. I think in gaming, this is an area where this will potentially go both ways in particular because you'll have people being able to generate their own content for games and in games. But then, as you said, you, you, have, you can have games respond to you in a much more convincing, dynamic way, right? You can think of 
open-ended stories that keep generating content for you to explore. So I think that's an interesting angle as well. While we're talking about the future then, so I know it's not all rosy, right? We, we've spoken about a lot of good things in, in, in Web3 gaming, essentially. What do you see as the main obstacles to Web3 games or games like Metal Core that have a Web3 component? I mean, I feel like you've already solved this for yourself by making it open uh, in, in a Web2 sense and a Web3 sense. But in, in, in a broader way, what do you think the obstacles are? Like, is it demand? Do you think the demand is there? Do you think it'd be hard to get people using the wallets and things like that? What for you is going to be the big challenge? I think we're over the hump of traditionally that was UX early web three UX was really brutal. Trying to play Axie infinity in 2021 was like, I have to buy these extremely expensive NFTs and then bridge them and then make sure that my wallet is mirrored on both sides and has enough tokens to pay the gas fees. And it's, it was just a, a nightmare, right? We've, I think we pretty much have gotten over that hump of UX, basically creating a, a wallet at this point is essentially like a one click thing that you can do uh, custodial or non-custodial things like immutable passport have solved this so i don't think ux is, is the main barrier anymore there is still going to be some reticence from the web 2 crowd that doesn't want to come over to web 3. i think that's just a matter of time i think you're seeing a similar kind of reaction in the market as you saw with the advent of free to play, with mobile games, with even like Steam, right? Like there, I remember a time when a bunch of gamers were like, wait, you mean I have to buy this game on Steam and I don't even own a physical copy and they can revoke my access to it at any time and no thank you, right? Same thing happened with the advent of free to play, same thing happened with mobile games, et cetera. So I think the same thing's happening right now with Web3 traditional gaming communities are not interested in it. And I'm hoping that games like ours can start to start to bridge that gap because I don't think there's anything to be inherently scared about in Web3. I think that there are some historical issues with Web3 that that we have to be honest about. We're, we're past the, the, the problem of the environmental in, impact, which was a very real problem in 2019, 2020. But with the advent of Layer 2s, it's not really an issue anymore. The other big thing that is a valid concern is that there are, it's still being so early in the cycle of regulation and so so young in the industry, like there's a lot of scams in Web3. And by its decentralized nature, it's very difficult to completely eliminate all scams. And so we have to work a little bit extra hard in making sure that people will trust us, essentially, right? So I would the answer to your question is basically like fixing this go-to-market pathway for game developers. It's pretty hard to publish a game in Web3, not necessarily from a technical perspective, but just from knowing the right path to take. There's so many blockchains you could be on. There's so many approaches to the way that you could structure your tokenomics and monetize your game and who to work with and partners that you could have and et cetera. So I think like it, it, it's very complicated and it's a very nascent industry for games. So just helping the game dev industry figure that out and, and navigate that will be a huge way to onboard more game devs to become more comfortable in releasing good games on Web3. And ultimately, that's really what will change everybody's mind is when there's enough good games on Web3 that people will just start to see, oh, this is just, why wouldn't I want to play this, right? So I think that, that mostly covers it, right? It's solving that kind of public narrative and then ma fixing this kind of go-to-market pathway. And the regulation is a big question mark too, right? So fixing, making it a little bit more secure for a game developer to get into that and, and knowing where they're going to end up. Yeah, I think you're so right about both the positive and negative aspects there. The fact that you are having to not only compete with the gaming industry at large, which is heavily funded, heavily lucrative, big players involved, but you also have to compete with the narratives of, okay, this game has a token, 90% of those are potentially out there to be to, to scam you. You, know, you don't know how high that number is, so you have to overcome that barrier. It's interesting that you say you don't, you think we're over the UX hump, because I think you might be the first person who said that, that we've had on the show. But I think there's truth to it coming from someone in the gaming world, right? Because we, we've often talked about in our episodes, the fact that the gaming industry often leads the way in a lot of things. A lot of the Web3 concepts, I think, have been, to be honest, there in the background or in, in maybe not in name, but in principle for a long time. So, yeah, I think gamers, not to stereotype, but gamers like us typically are more predisposed to being a bit more tech savvy, a bit more open to new ideas. So I think it's really interesting that you said that. And I just wanted to point that out. So I also would like to maybe just finish on this future looking angle and just ignore gaming for a minute. But what are you excited about in Web3 in general outside of the gaming sphere? Is there any particular use case or something you'd like to see that, that would happen in the future? Honestly, I personally think that 
that gaming is one of the most natural applications of Web3. So I am I'm really happy that we're taking the front the forefront of Web3 innovation. I do think that there's some really interesting kind of social fi concepts that you could do in Web3. I think using Web3 as a kind of proof of identity mechanism or proof of group membership mechanism or proof of as a voting proxy, et cetera, et cetera, like doing so, this kind of thing in a really provable and open way could be a really cool application of Web3 that I think is that there's a lot of applications that are starting to come to market now that are really exciting in that space too. Yeah, I like that one. We've had we've had a few episodes now, a few guests that have come on and spoken specifically about digital identity systems and self-sovereign identity systems and how all of that relates to the world of AI when the AI data comes from somewhere. And do you want your data just being scraped off the internet or do you want verified data that you've selectively disclosed from your mobile and you're rewarded for? But we're a long way from that, I think. I don't think that the governments are ready to start implementing that. And they're starting to have yeah. the money for that. <laughs> right. But Dan... We're coming to the end. Like this has been such a fantastic episode and so informative. We have a section now where, in which we have two questions basically that we ask all of our guests, and we like to see how the answers vary over time and depending on the person and the background themselves. So the first question is: In one sentence, what is Web three to you? In one sentence, what is Web three to me? Um, it's a, a way for people to really own their identity and their their items, their inventory, their things, right? It's true ownership. I like that. That's good. True ownership. Uh, that could have been a two-word one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that's go. good. <laughs> and then the second question is, if you could choose anybody in the world from throughout history or even fictional to sit down with and discuss Web3, who would it be and why? And discuss Web3. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um that's a tough one. Jeez. And discuss Web3. Um, I don't know. I, uh, maybe Alan Turing, right? Because he's one of my idols. And I think he'd be really fascinating. But if, maybe I w- I'd probably prefer to discuss AI with him. But Web3, I think he yeah. might be interested in as well. So we define the Web3 umbrella as all of these kind of emergent technologies, including AI. I think most people just think of it as just blockchain, but we've taken the umbrella approach of everything kind of fits under the thing. <laughs> sure. There you go. Then definitely Alan Turing. Yeah, I think he'd be an interesting one to ask, is Bitcoin Turing complete and is Ethereum Turing complete? Because I think he'd have some interesting opinions on all that debate for the techies. So listen, Dan, it's been such a great episode. It's flown by for me. I don't know about you. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. And I want to wish you the best of luck for Metalcore. Hopefully we'll have you on again in the future to see how everything's going in the world of the mechs in your game. So yeah, and all that remains for us is to say to our audience, thank you for listening, wherever you may be. And join us next time as we entangle a little more Web3. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Untangling Web3. Don't forget to send us your thoughts, questions, and comments on social media. And be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast provider to catch the next episode. See you next time to untangle a little bit more of Web3. The views we express here are our own and do not reflect the views of our employers.